African American studies, um, African American studies um, at Fulton Uni Community College uh, District. And from 2003 to 2011, she was a professor of women and gender studies at California State University. And she focuses, currently focuses on, um, and is the co and she is also the co author with Stephen Shames of the, the newly published book, Comrade Sisters, Women of the Black Panther Party, published in fall of 2022. Um, we want to give Erica a, a, a hearty welcome. Uh, she will be followed by James Tracy. Um, James Tracy is a Bay Area native, community organizer. He has 30 years of experience in the politics of housing, economic justice, and social movements. James has founded the Eviction Defense Network in 1992, which used direct action to stop evictions. He's a member of a number of different coalitions, including the Coalition of Homelessness, Mission Agenda, and Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition. Um, and in 19, 2004, excuse me, James co-founded the San Francisco Community Land Trust. He now serves as vice president of the board of the Bay Area Community Land Trust. Um, James is also the co-author of Hillbilly Nationalism, Urban Race Rebellions, Rebels in Black Power, Interracial Solidarity in the 1960s and 70s. Um, that's recently come out of Melville Press. Um, we can welcome James. Um, and last but not least, I um, want to welcome Kamau Franklin. Kamau um, is the founder of the Community Movement Builders. He has been a dedicated community organizer for over 30 years, beginning in New York City, and now is based in Atlanta. For 18 of those years, Kamau was a leading member of the National Grassroots Organization dedicated to the ideas of self-determination and the teachers of Malcolm X. Um, he has spearheaded organizing work in the various areas, including youth organizing, development, police, de police misconduct, and development of sustainable urban communities. Um, um, in addition, has coordinated and led community cop watch programs, liberation freedom schools for youth, electoral policy, and campaigns. Um, uh, Kamau uh, has been an attorney for over 10 years. Um, and he currently, as I mentioned before, currently lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, welcome, Kamau. Um, and so, um, and so I want to welcome all of you. And of course, um, part of, and, um, again, thank you to Yvonne. Um, and again, happy Valentine's Day. Um, I would start probably as saying that the, uh, in the words of Che Guevara, um, at the risk of sounding ridiculous, revolutionaries are um, led and guided by great feelings of love. Um, and I think that, you know, today's program is going to be one that's focusing primarily on, you know, a love ethic, um, one of love for each other, um, and the relationship between love between each other, the land, and also for justice. Um, specifically founded in the works of intercommunalism. Um, you should know that the reason that we're here tonight is that primarily is because of an initiative led by um, Los Angeles for All and the Municipalism Network of a study group that's ongoing on Huey P. Newton's um, notion of, of intercommunalism that's been meeting for the past month or so. Um, this study group has been, even though it was initiated in the West Coast um, has been uh, expanded and has participants from throughout the country and also from parts of uh, Australia and Canada as well. Um, so why intercommunalism? Why now? Um, I, think for, I think for some of us, specifically myself, uh, who, who's, been, who's been a veteran of political activism for a number of years, both in terms of the fight against police brutality, for education justice, and also against, against global anti-globalization anti movements. Huey P. Newton's words resonate deeply because there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a specific call for solidarity and solidarity in the face of horror. Indeed, 
um, in Huey's writings of, around intercommunalism, he wrote at a time when, when repression and in, in, in the, in the idea around imprisonment was, was, was incredibly real. So real that, that, that the organization he founded, the Black Panther Party, faced a number of, 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 of deaths and killings by the state and repression by the state. That being so, in the face of it, the idea of, of, of communities coming together and finding solidarities with each other and among each other, based based not on uh, on exploitation, but on but on but on non-exploitative relationships, are very attractive today. For me, I found Huey P. News work during the, during the heat of the anti-globalization movement. And in many ways, at that time, the, the, the popular book was Hardy Negre's text, Empire, which actually described the disillusionment of the nation state in the face, in, 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 in place of the nation state, the, the creation of an overarching empire that had its tentacles throughout the world in different communities. As a as a as a post soul seventies baby, who saw the who saw the de, the deindustrialization of the cities, the crack trade, the rampant police violence, the idea of empire spoke highly to me. For myself, the state was not something that existed as a as a as as a place of help or even even as a as a as a mutual arbitrator, but as a as a as a as a space of of, of overarching oppression. In the same ways, Hugh P. Newton's idea some 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 fifty years earlier, before Hard and Negre, Hugh P. Newton's lectures at Boston College, and, and subsequently his conversations with the child psychologist Eric Erickson, offered similar analysis of 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 through, through the through the lens of intercommunalism. Intercommunalism for Huey was an understanding of the of the disillusionment. Dis, dis, of the nation state, but in, but in that time, within that context of, of, of understanding of, of people's revolutionary potential, indeed, much of Huey's understanding came from the solidaric, solidaristic movements that happened, that happened during the, the, the development of the Black Panther Party, namely the victories of the Viennese against the United States in the Vietnam War, the subsequent victories of the African and Latin American movements of anti-imperialism, and also the high tide of black liberation in this country. In all of our understanding of, 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 of intercommunalism, I do want to focus on three, three key points um, that I think is very important. One is philosophy. Two is a power analysis, and three is solidarity of survival pending revolution. And four, and actually a fourth point, expanding we. One, in reading, in reading of, in concerning Huey's Newton's notion of intercommunalism, is that its is, is, is starting point is a rereading and a re understanding of, of dialectical materialism. For Huey, the the, the, the struggle around philosophy has always was always between theory and practice, or in, in the Western understanding, a materialism that's that a, a materialism between materialism and, and idealist thought. In Huey's understanding of of, of of Western philosophy, that the idealist thought exists had that ideas had no had no had no inference outside of practice and that for materialism that materialism existed with 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 simply things existing outside of human realms beyond our understanding he was he was understanding of bringing back marx Kant, and hegel in the conversation of philosophy specifically around intercommunalism sought to sought to start to build a bridge between between theory and practice. Indeed, in many ways, 
Huey, Huey, Huey's ideas that also informed the, the founding of the Black Panther Party allowed for a development of the idea that Marx had that the educator must be educated. Um, in, in, in that sense, foundational to the Black Panther Party was a whole entire idea that, that, that the question of pedagogy, the question on teaching, the question around the people being the center of their own action, or what Lenin called the dignity of practice, was this was the central part of the organizing of the, of the party altogether? Which brings me to my second part: power analysis. The question around power has a lot to do with the question around the question around race, class, and education in this country. Indeed, in many black communities in the 1960s, even today, the black community is seen as a zone of non-being, a zone of exploitation a zone of, 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 of deadness to be ripped, off, ripped open by capital. There's no potential, no, no sense of life in the eyes of capital. Black life simply exists to be exploited for super profits. The understanding buried within the idea of, of, a, of a community is that community or commune is the fact that power lies within. That, that, that even spatially, the Black Panther Party being founded in West Oakland with his, with his back towards the Bay and, and facing racist police of oppression could, could find his own horizon, could find his own meaning in, 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 that, in, in, in the organizing of the people themselves. That the people themselves led an understanding of, of within the idea of practice could actually lead and create their own sense of survival and also create different types of a different type of economy, a different type of society that's 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 that that exists non hierarchical uh, um, with with even with even 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 in the context of even challenging gender and sexuality norms. This this idea around power to the people, you know, was thoroughly democratic, non-hierarchical, and and led and led to 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 a sense of led to a sense of potential among the black community, but also spatially. The very fact of the matter is is that within the black community, that that potential allowed for a new type of solidarity, not only on a national front but also internationally. In the 1960s, neighborhoods like Watts, Harlem, West Oakland, um, Detroit, Michigan, were also in the same context, were also breathed in the same breath as places as Algiers, Havana, um, Guinea-Bissau, and other, and other places that, that, were, that were fighting for liberation. And in this sense, that, that, that people sent to the liberation Allow for the potential for liberated zones, and for and for space for new for new politics to take place. Which also brings me to my third point: survival pending revolution. The question on survival for Huey was a, was was always was always at the front forefront. For the Black Panther Party, the question of survival was was in the face of consistent police repression and the potential of genocide the potential of, of being wiped off the face of the planet. The question that I think oftentimes we ask as revolutionaries, what do we fight for? And sometimes as revolutionaries, all we fight for is time. Sometimes the time to, to, to expand ourselves, time to learn, time to live, time to raise children. And in this sense, solidarity and survival, survival meant that, that, that meant a longer protracted struggle but it also meant the ability for people to understand and to think what are the institutions that need to be created that allow us to give us time. In this period of time, the Black Panther Party, during this period of the survival of the revolution, developed um, health care clinics, um, ambulance corps, um, doc, um, um, trips to prisons, and, and the like. And these, and these programs were also replicated by other organizations, such as the Brown Berets, the Young Lords, 
and 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 also the young patriots there was a there was a there was a there was a tremendous understanding that these questions around survival of organizing in the face of what Ruthie Gilmore called the organized abandonment of our communities by the state would not only give the seed to new life but also give them the seed to new to new parts new political possibilities to give new seeds to new to new to new thought to new ideas but also to new practices today the question around the survival pen of pending revolution is also a question that allows for the question of a new solidistic a new solidarity economy to take place to reimagine and what the control of the means of production the control of the means of life whether it be housing health care or the economy would mean to the to the vast majority of the people and this is all and this is the question that is in the face of the, my fourth point which is intercommunalism as a bigger we um the question that we're faced right now and i think the question is is that of, of that is that which tony k babar was asked can we save the world from the psychopaths the question around a bigger we is a question that 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 we're facing in the face of environment destruction genocide and the potential loss of life as we know it these are all existential threats to all ourselves individually and collectively but as we've seen in 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 both in the, in, the, in the moment of 1971 in which which in which Harry P Newman has developed these ideas to the period of of 2022 and beyond with George Floyd and the, and the the movement for black lives and the movement currently around the, the freedom of Palestine is that the necessity of, of international solidarity the in what is all or or rather intercommunal solidarity the question around community is in fact the question that we have in terms of what is the bigger we that we're fighting for how do we how do we define and in 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 create the structures of 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 a big of us in the face of also the very particular problems and particular particular problems of life that we all face this is this is part of the charge of tonight's today's program and i can't think of 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 anybody else to have a conversation with than than the my fellow co-panelists all of whom have in some ways been informed thought through and and consistently and have brought forward some of the work of Huey's into communalism in the 21st century um and with, with and with that i consider it i consider it an honor to be and to be a, in 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 this conversation um to offer some 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 of, some of these ideas but also some of the charges too the questions of course you know where do we find where do we find the 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 space for for theory and practice today where do we find the dignity of practice how do we develop the bigger we how do we overcome national boundaries these are some of the questions that we will we'll be discussing today and i'm looking forward to to being equally educated in being a student today as i am being a moderator thank you um so um i would um i would like to turn the floor over um right now to um to um to erica are you still there yes um and i was wondering maybe if you want to start with um your presentation for 10 for 10 minutes and then we'll continue and then we'll take some questions okay okay and and if i don't take 10 minutes then the persons who follow me can take them uh, thank you uh cause for your introduction to the panel and to intercommunalism i want to say simply that i was there and i think that sometimes when we look back at history we have our view of it 
if we weren't there. Like a child who is born in birth order as the baby may not know the same parents. So I hope that what I just said is understood. And I thought that it would be important to look back at, look back and then look forward. Look at the present moment as it impacts the future. And I reread Huey's um, speech at Boston College and I loved it. And it, I was incarcerated then. Actually, he opens it by saying, um, for the chairman, he meant Bobby Seale, for Erica Huggins, for Angela Davis, for the New York 21 and the Soledad brothers, for all political prisoners and prisoners of war, I begin. And I think that sometimes we get mired in uh, philosophy. And Huey, throughout this talk, speaks about the necessity of putting what the philosophy is saying and encouraging us to do into action. He also describes why we had the community survival programs. But before that, he said that the 10 point program is a survival program. And I wanted to read it. And as you listen, this is the version updated in 1972, which is a long time ago. But the version in 1966 wasn't as clear or inclusive. That is why we were always willing to change if we knew how. I'm talking about the Black Panther Party. So here it is. And I didn't make it something to share screen. I'm just gonna read it. And thank you, by the way, to all of the participants. And thank you very much to the interpreters, both in Spanish and ASL. Thank you for the work that you're doing. It's important. You are speakers as well. The Black Panther Party 10 point program and platform updated 1972, we want freedom. We want power to determine the destiny of our own black and oppressed communities. I ask when you listen, listen for if this is still true, do we still need these things today? Two, we want full employment for our people. Three, we want an end to the robbery by capitalism of our black and oppressed communities. Four, we want decent housing fit for the shelter of human beings. Five, we want a decent education for our people that exposes the true nature of this society. We want an education that teaches us our true history and our role in the present day society. We want completely free healthcare for all black and oppressed people. That was six, seven, we want an immediate end to police brutality and murder of black people, people of color, all oppressed people inside and outside the United States. We want an immediate end to all wars of aggression. Let me read that one again. We want an immediate end to all wars of aggression. That was point eight. Nine, we want freedom for all black and oppressed people now held in US federal, state, county, city, and military prisons and jails. We want trials by a jury of peers for all persons charged with so-called crimes under the laws of this country. 10, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, peace, 
and people's community control of modern technology. Are you letting that land? We wrote it then, actually Bobby and Seal and Huey Newton wrote it on a yellow legal pad at a community college in Oakland. And it is still, in my opinion, in need of consideration by us and action. And what can we do? What can we do? In his talk, Huey lays out history from 1917 to the present day of 1970 for his talk. He talks about the philosophies of the world. He talks about the ideologies. He talks about the dominance and control of the United States all over the world. He talks about the necessity for interconnected and non-nation state collectivity. He coins intercommunalism. And I think that I, I know, I know, I don't just think it, I know it. Knowledge is power, isn't it? That our community survival programs were a blueprint for how to move toward shifting away from the dominant culture and governments and doing for ourselves, not as a separation from anything. It wasn't racialized. It wasn't even especially rooted in being black. Huey was looking at the entire world at the time, the Vietnam War raging, and all of the wars in Africa, and the war in our communities at home. So he goes on to say a very beautiful thing about the community survival programs, and I'm focused on them because I've worked in them. Not only did I sell party newspaper on street corners, but I also fed children breakfast. That would be before I was grief stricken by the United States government, killing my best friend and husband, John Huggins, and my beloved friend, Alprentice Bunchy Carter, leaving me a widow and a single mother. And then four months later, I was incarcerated. So I didn't get for two years, no bail, awaiting trial. And we know today, by the way, just a side point, we know today that there are people who need psychological help, who are in power in our government, but yet there I was. So I'm coming back to the fact that our, um, our feeding children, our opening free clinics, our having the free busing to prisons programs, our schools, our sickle cell anemia testing on street corners, our seniors programs, everything that we did was fully replicable so that right now, today, we could redo it. I guess I have spoken 10 minutes. It, 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 it didn't feel that way, but I, I will speak with you again. And thank you for listening. And thank you for letting the 10 point program land. Thank you.
I'm not sure if, uh, I know everyone wants you to continue, Erica. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the, the Q&A. Thank you so much. I, I'm sorry, I'm just stepping in for Kazembe briefly. So I'm gonna pass it to James now. Good afternoon, everyone. It's honored to be in this space. Uh, very hard, hard act to follow, Erica Huggins, but it's very good to be on a panel with you again and with the great Kamal Franklin, whose work I've, re I've respected from afar for uh, many years. I'm going to talk a little bit about an experiment in intercommunalism called the First Rain Rainbow Coalition, and I want to acknowledge that the, uh, the work of, uh, of unearthing the story of the First Rainbow Coalition is very collective. Uh, my uh, co-author and I, Amy Senny, kind of were the first ones out of the gate, but this history has been continued by the fantastic memoir that Young Patriot High Thurman wrote, uh, re the wonderful film re uh, that Ray Santabassian uh, produced. Uh, Jacoby Williams, fantastic, uh, fa fantastic book, and also my good friend Delio Vasquez's uh, work on intercommunalism and many others. Right, there's so many others, that, and this story used to only exist in the footnotes of Panther books. Right, you know, there used to be the the footnote. And by the way, Fred Hampton did something really cool with people with with people that weren't black. Right, and then named it, and that was it. Right, and so this story was handed to. Me handed to me through action uh, my mentors in the 90s uh, malik rahim and uh who many of you uh, know i uh, was chair of the new orleans chapter but someone that you probably don't know bethola harper uh, who was a panther in the bay area and also uh, bla member and ran safe houses for people who were trying trying to avoid uh, long prison sentences for uh Thing. So they ha handed me the story and the ideas of intercommunalism uh, there, um, largely by knocking on doors and cooking food for events. That's how these stories were passed on to me originally. So um, intercommunalism, of course, uh, was popularized by Huey Newton in 1970. But before that, uh, we see the first Rainbow Coalition emerging in, uh, in the previous uh, years. To my knowledge, I don't I've never read uh, Huey Newton directly referencing the first Rainbow Coalition, but you can definitely see the way that they organized uh, that there was a connection. We also know that Bobby Seal uh, himself, uh, lots of news. There's lots of news reels with him talking about uh, how unique this coalition was. So the first formal Rainbow Co uh, Coalition uh, was the Illinois Panthers. The Puerto Rican young young lords of Chicago and the poor white uh, young patriots coming together. So when I use the term Rainbow Coalition, I kind of mean two things. One is the Big R Rainbow Coalition, a form of uh, coalition with former membership, one that uh, it expanded at times to include uh, Rising Up Angry, the Intercommunal Survival Committee, Ewar Quinn in the American Indian movement. But there's also a small R rainbow coalition adopted by many radical formations, not just ones that involved uh, the Panthers at the time. Um, in this model, um, uh, you know, usually ethnically specific organizations took responsibility to organize their own while coming together in in an alliance and when i say usually ethnically specific organizations we also see in later times uh, the idea of a ra rainbow coalition uh, being extended to uh, queer political uh, uh, formations women-centered ones so on and so forth so what are some of the uh, some of the elements of a of a rainbow coalition of course there is the division of labor that i just mentioned the self-interest to solidarity which is makes the Rain Rainbow Coalition organizing very different than the Solinsky model, right? Because Solinsky model is about common self-interest, uh, which is an important step, right? When you're organ organizing, but it's not the end of the journey. It's like uh, through exp uh, through common campaigns, political education, arguments. Um, analyzing how people turn up when assaulted by the state. The idea is to bring people to a point 
where they're not just in the struggle to uh, satisfy their own community's needs, but they also see solidarity with others. And kind of piggybacking on er Erica's wonderful talk, uh, the community service programs were essential to this, right? Because people, you know, most people being uh, coming into the struggle who weren't uh, previously politically committed um, needed an experience of working across uh, the, co the the color lines, right? And so we see we see the Panthers largely under the leadership of uh, one of my heroes, Bob Lee, tutoring other organizations. Like here's here's how we set up a community ser ser service uh, project or survival pending revolution uh, project. Now you can go ahead and adapt this to your own community needs. We see the Patriots even doing like a in Eugene, Oregon, uh, the Patriot Party having a free free uh, wood program, right? In a rural in a rural area, adapting. It's anti-capitalist, uh, which of course sets sets it apart from many things. Anti-imperialist, um, and the really big uh, big emphasis that each organization retained its own command structure, whatever that be. So having the autonomy and the self determination. Uh, to make decisions in, in for their own organization and their own communities how they saw fit, but being accountable to each other around mutually agreed upon uh, coalition uh, things. So, Bob Lee, I'm sorry, James. Um, the interpreters are asking if you could speak slower. Please okay, speak. sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, Bob Lee, who was the field secretary for the Chicago Panthers. Uh, told me uh, that the Rainbow Coalition was a code word for a class struggle. So, what we a question that we can ask ourselves uh, today is why are code code words even needed right now? Why are such projects like this even uh, even needed uh, today? To wind down a little bit, I to say that. Uh, we have a lot for those of us who are inspired by municipalism and inspired by intercommunalism. Uh, we have some some questions to ask ourselves. We uh, just by implication, we are uh, uh, we're looking towards a world where power is decentralized and uh, and exercised mostly on a polity is is mostly exercised on a very local level. Now, in the United States, the most effective localists, right, are our enemies, right, are uh, people who, uh, you know, people who look at localism, states' rights, posse com comitatus uh, acts and things like that as a way to prevent us from getting to the, achieving the goals of the 10, 10 point program, which isn't an argument against doing it, but it has to inform our strategy in order to prevent far right entryism into an intercommunal uh, coalition. And uh, we also have to think about how do we promote the type of political education that leads to the deepest, most principled forms of solidarity um, with, with auto autonomy. Uh, I'll wrap up. I'll wrap up there. I think that this uh, this history has a lot of clues. It's it's always perilous to try to duplicate something, uh, you know, heroic project from the past. But there are still so many clues from uh, the first Rainbow Coalition that uh, that can inform really good organizing today, including how do we build a united front against uh, against fascism. But in the interest of time, I'm going to cut it, uh, cut it off there, and maybe we can return to that in the dialogue piece. If you want, I can just jump in. Okay. <laughs> yeah, jump in. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Uh, one, I just want to thank everybody for having me and including me at this. Uh, it's an honor to both be on with James and with Erica Huggins. Um, so I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, on the little uh, I know about intercommunalism, but the uh, actual work that I do that really does involve intercommunalism. So um, so I said that to say that like, I, I also think I might have been brought on to be somewhat contrary or on certain points. So let's see if that, if that pans out. Uh, so I still consider myself a revolutionary nationalist an internationalist and a pan-Africanist. 
Those have always been the basis of my politics and my political struggle. But within that, the focus of or hearing about intercommunalism, particularly the focus on liberated territories, always struck me as extremely important within the organizing, uh, particularly of Black organizers in the United States. Not exclusively, but particularly struck me as important. When I look back at our own history of struggle in organizing, the organizations that have made the biggest impact in terms of pol Black political radical organizations have took on aspects of the liberated territory paradigm. Uh, and so obviously speaking about the Panthers, you know, the UNIA, United Negro Improvement Association, Garvey, the Nation of Islam, even SNCC, Right, deep dive community organizing um, is the heart of what liberated territory is, because it means that you are going into communities and working one on one, uh, day and night. You are living in these communities. People are moving to these communities. They're creating freedom schools or liberation schools. All the things that Erica spoke about. They're digging in deep with particular communities in order to help and to work with and to learn as well teach political understanding of how the system work, works, how to organize against the system, how to fight back against the system, what system, what are the tools at hand, both locally, where can we share places to share knowledge, places to share resources, et cetera, et cetera. I myself have worked on two different liberation uh, um, I, would, I would definitely call them liberated territory ideas. One was when I was with the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, a new African formation, and we started the Jackson Plan in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, and part of that Jackson Plan was the very idea that we were going to take over Jackson. We were going to take over Jackson through not only electoral politics, but grassroots organizing, resource building, all of those things were within, were within the plan of action of organizing in Jackson, Mississippi. It was a, an, an idea of liberated territory. Obviously, we didn't begin the idea. That was something that has a historical roots to it. But we wanted to sort of reinvigorate what we were doing as an organization, particularly after Obama was elected the president of the empire. The second one is the current liberated territory uh, organizing that I'm doing is with community movement builders, where we are working, uh, we have seven chapters across the country, but particularly in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Southwest area of Atlanta called Pittsburgh, we are trying to build out a similar uh, liberated territory idea where we have members who have actually moved to the community. Um, we've organized with people in the neighborhood, we brought purchased property in the community. We have a community house. We're about to try to build a second and or third community house. Uh, we're trying to get office space. We have uh, we are the caretakers of of the of a local community garden that is owned by the city, but we are the caretakers of. And so similarly, we are working, and we're working with anarchist groups. We're working with other black um, uh, revolutionary and radical groups other folks who consider themselves to have revolutionary and radical politics. We even work at times with people who are progressive because it helps us in terms of furthering our goals, right? Um, and so we see that as a root of organizing, but for us, that root of organizing is also linked to, uh, does it help us challenge the state more, right? Does it allow us to have areas of control, even if they are not complete areas of control, but areas of control where we can dig deep and again, work with the population and the hope being that that will be a basis to fight back against, right? A, a spring well, a place uh, in which fighting back can take place. And I think this is a particularly important idea within the context of the United States because of the fragmentation, uh, not only based on class and ethnicity and race. So I think sometimes when folks come together in certain areas and work close together and then reach out to other groups in other areas that the basis of work becomes that much more deeper. And sometimes that does, that is able to break down certain barriers to how organizations or individuals prefer to sort of work with each other when it comes to organizing. 
Now, I don't think that this idea of liberated ter territory is one that comes without a lot of um, issues built in with it, right? It is limited in scope, right? The most important thing, of course, uh, when we think about it is that it is still surrounded by the state capitalist system, right? Um, so just as we can look upon, if we, if we uh, further stretch the idea of liberated territory, we can look at Cuba as liberated territory. We can look at Venezuela as liberated territory. We can look at Gaza for a while as liberated territory. What happens to liberated territory that is surrounded by a state, a, a, cap, a worldwide capitalist system? It gets surrounded, it gets acted upon, it gets directed, it gets derailed. Massacres can also occur, right? So when we look at the idea, the idea by itself, particularly again of the liberated territory idea, does not work unless we are obviously challenging the larger state at hand, right? It doesn't work unless we are sure that we're not seeking out only to capture small islands of space which become effectively Bantu stands, but that we are looking to say that the ideas of liberated territory work best when there's a complete understanding that this may be a space for us to organize in, but it is a space which is going to come under constant attack. And it is a space where we have to be able to mobilize from and to give up at times when we can no longer hold the space because there are other things that are, might be more important. Um, there are class dynamics in liberated territory. In the, in the area that we are currently doing work uh, in Southwest Atlanta, we've not necessarily been embraced by the larger community, which are looking at their home prices. As we talk about gentrification for those who are homeowners, for people who see themselves as linked to, uh, uh, particularly in a black city or a city that used to be black, but is no longer black, but still likes to uphold that. Um, that's linked to the bourgeois ethos of having black mayors and black city councils and a couple of uh, rich black folks who own businesses. And they see themselves on that scale as opposed to who are these so-called radical organizers who are trying to tell us about how to organize in our community, right? Even when you try to work against that dynamic, and I don't think we've necessarily as an organization or a chapter in Atlanta been completely successful in winning the hearts and minds uh, of the of folks who live in in the particular areas, and I don't think that I think that same thing is true in Jackson. Even though people who were very politicized were able to win a, 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 an elected office, that elected office has been constrained by its actions uh, by a larger state entity. In Atlanta, we've been constrained by our actions by a larger city entity, like a, a liberal, uh, so-called liberal black democratic run city and a conservative white supremacist run state, which have constrained our actions, not only in terms of liberated territory, but also in terms of our work on cop city. So I think as we talk through and I'll wrap here, as we talk through the ideas of the larger ideas of intercommunalism, um, and some of the ways in which they get enacted through the idea of liberated territory. Uh, for me, it doesn't necessarily solve our problem by itself, but it seems to be, for me, steps in the direction of how we move forward in capturing resources, land, and space in which we can organize people. I can stop there. Okay. That's, all right, that's wonderful. Um, and so I wanted this to, to remind us that we're now we're in the, um, the second round, and I think we have about a, a, a time for five minute responses from each of the um, panelists. Maybe going into some of that, um, the court, some of that, uh, court, some maybe some statements that um, want, want to get finished. I know some people wanted Erica to maybe finish, or maybe she has a response to some of the statements by uh, James and and come out, but I'll turn it over to Erica right now for any responses, and then followed by um, James and then come out. Well, I, I don't have anything at the top of mind um, or heart. In response to James and come out, thank you both very much. Um, I, 
just wanted to say that I, I, I feel that what you both are doing is really very important. And I think there are all kinds of works that those of us on this panel, including Paz, and those of us participating in, in this Zoom can do. And it's much bigger than each of us. I do want to say one thing that I didn't get to say, thank you, Kaz, and, and it's important, that everything I learned in the Black Panther Party, every single shift in ideology and philosophy has, has carried me through the rest of my life because everything that the party was about was based on love, as Kaz said when he began. And I think that I'm not just saying that as a woman, you know, we often think that women are softer or something, more intuitive or something. I'm not sure about that, but I am sure I've learned something that is indelibly imprinted in my heart and mind. I'll give you an example. When I stepped into HIV AIDS, work at the height of that pandemic. By the way, that pandemic taught me how to be very present in this one we just passed through. I saw that black and brown and other people of color were dying at higher rates than white people. It wasn't, I wasn't surprised. It's not the fault of the people who were surviving it. It's structural. And so I helped organizations to start programs that were specifically for people of color, specifically for women and children when their husbands and boyfriends were saying, I'm not gay. I just sleep with men. So it, it was all of this that I learned in working in community. Like, like you said, Kamal, living there, moving there, spending your every waking hour in community and listening to people and, and following their lead. So I wanted to say that because um, it's so important to me and everything I learned, it's like the Nautilus. The Nautilus grows and keeps taking everything with it in that beautiful circular shell as it, as it grows forward. And that is what the Black Panther Party did for me. And, um, and I just want to make a note that when we talk quite often, we aren't talking about children and young people. And I'd like to hear us talk about that more. You know, how do we talk about intercommunalism with children? I do it, but I'm I'm putting this out for everyone. Um, all right, thank you. Can, can I follow up with a question, Sister Erica? Sure, but I thought we were we were okay. I will come. I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna save my question for a little bit later. Thank you for keeping me on point. Um, James, would you like to respond? And I remember you said something about the local. Um, I don't know if you want to go back to that point, but anything you want to just jump into? Uh, two quick things. One, I think that my comments and Kamal's comments about the limitations and the, uh, the questions that we have to address if we want to do this type of politics probably warrant a part two, a sequel to this wonderful pa panel, because I think they really need to be uh, de you know, delved, delved into. And I speak for the humbly as somebody who's been a part of two community land trust organizations right and watched um, even under the best circumstances a lot of energy is just being sucked into this uh, like preserving not even a block or a neighborhood but like one building right? so i would really really like to explore those uh, ideas uh, in the future but i also have a i was really touched by erica's uh, comments and it made me uh made me think that is the idea of intercommunalism does it is my question 
should it be put in dialogue with the idea of a beloved community uh, there? Because they're not the exact same thing, but there's so to me, there's so much overlap uh, between when you read, especially uh, King's dialogues on uh, on the beloved community near near the end of his life, not when he first started using uh, using the term. So I'll just throw those two out and uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, Kamau? I mean, really quickly, I, I would just add that one of the reasons why I think, again, some of the things that folks have spoken about in terms of deep dive community organizing is so important is because, you know, the way in which organizing is set up now, it moves us away from that kind of deep dive community organizing. Uh, and I think that's purposeful, of course, right? I think uh, 60s and 70s, our movements were destroyed by the state. I, I never say that they ended or collapsed. I always say that the state waged war and did what it could to destroy our movements and left us in the space of doing some of the things that James talked about, some limited work um, or organizations that get offices downtown um, but never go deep into the community, right? And I think that also comes with the nonprofitization of movement politics over the last 30 years, which again, I think is a purposeful shift, right? A purposeful shift away from things that the Panthers did, again, that SNCC did, that UNAI did, and others did. Deep dive community organizing is probably the hardest type of organizing you can do, but it is the most essential organizing that we can do because it is talking about working and with working class people, convincing them of their needs and interests, supporting them in terms of leading the way and gaining those needs and interests and fighting back against power. That is the most important essential work that I believe that organizers or community organizers can do. I also believe it's probably one of the most difficult types of work that organizers can try to engage in. Absolutely. Um, and and and, I, and I'm I'm in deep appreciation for all the responses I've given from the from our panelists so far. Um, I do want to give an opportunity for the audience and for all of us who are at home to ask questions. And the way you do so is that, and I believe there's a Q and A box that you that you can feel free to populate your questions. I'm going to go through some of the questions right now, um, and maybe uh, you know I'll give a chance for the panelists to respond. Um, either as a group or individually, but as you kind of like, you know, don't be shy. Uh, feel free to populate that Q&A box with some questions or comments, and I'll share it with the panelists. We have until 5.30, so we want to have at least, and it's, it's about 5.10 right now, so we want to have the balance of the time to uh, give to the audience to uh, ask questions. Um, so, again, feel free to populate that Q&A box. Um, and then I will start off... Um, let me choose one. Um, this is this is a question from SRO Collab. I'm new to intercommunalism, and I work with an org building a community land trust in a community living below the poverty line. I also live in a community. My question is, how do each each how do you each personally keep an internationalist perspective while doing deeply relational local work? How do you keep the connections between our local struggles in view? Um, does anyone want to take that on? I can quickly say, you know, part of our work, particularly in, in community movement builders, is to think of ourselves as not only a local organization, but a national and international one. And so we currently do work with uh, Haitian organizations around liberated territory, um, helping them create a community, uh, a community center uh, where they're doing some of the same practices that we're doing, right? So I think that's important. I think it's always important that folks understand that we connect and we don't, you know, we try, we, uh, sometimes it's in art folks, sometimes it's not, but we connect the struggles in Palestine to the black liberation struggle here in the United States. We talk about it. We make sure it's part of the speeches or the ways in which we discuss uh, politics. We have political education series with people in the neighborhood where we talk about capitalism and internationalism 
um, Pan-Africanism so that people can understand that uh, uh, our struggles are not in competition with each other. Our struggles are united because we have common enemies who look uh, to oppress us um, and take resources, take land and control people. And so we know that these struggles have to be connected. Otherwise, we're all going to fail. Um, so that's a quick answer. Um, I'll be I'll be really brief on that. It's it's really difficult uh, because we're we're in such a battle for ideas and even true uh, you know common understanding of truth. I'll give an example from the land trust movement. Is there's those of us in the land trust movement that trace the history back to the communist co-ops of of New York, the battle for new communities in Georgia different anti-racist fights. And there's some people who I otherwise absolutely respect, uh, whose work is fantastic, who want to connect that history directly to the kibbutz in, uh, in, uh, in, in occupied Palestine. So there's a certain just kind of every everyday historical dialogue of like, well, actually, you know, actually the connections to this movement did not come from that ex experience. Um, and um, and doing doing that historical and political education work, which a lot of times in uh, in the nonprofit world, which you have to have a nonprofit to have a, a, a tax exempt uh, land trust, or they become incredibly uh, expensive. You attract people that are absolutely do not want to have those conversations. Um, Erica, would you like to respond? Is there time? Absolutely. It's more enough time. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that there is a movement in Brazil. It's called Santerra. And I was there and invited to go to public land that they had taken over in, in Sao Paulo, which is one of the largest cities in the, one of the three largest cities in the world. I was astounded at what they were doing. They would live on the land, re refurbish the land with recycled materials, bring their families there, put in irrigation, um, and then teach people how to build their own homes and live in them one home at a time. You see, sometimes we're so 21st century that we want things to happen as quick as a text, knowing that they'll last as long as a Snapchat. So at any rate, we, we I learned so much there in visiting with the people and the children and the and the grandparents, I mean, every age was involved in this move, is involved in this movement. And it moved huge numbers of people off of the sides of the freeways, the highways. And I still stay in touch with some of those people because I was so inspired by them. So we can learn internationally. And where did I, where did I learn to think internationally? You know, the Black Panther Party had chapters all over the world. Did you know that? We weren't just local and we didn't think locally alone. We thought about this world, the whole of it and the people in it and all of its needs and all of its cultures. And we did not, well, we didn't preach to people about what they ought to be doing. So listening is a very wonderful thing, but I would, I would suggest that the question asker look up the Samtera movement. It's incredible. And it didn't start just a few years ago. Um, wonderful. Um, I have a question from Laura Sch uh, Schleffler, and I apologize if I'm butchering your name. My apologies, Laura, Laura Schleffler. And it says, I'm wondering, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak a, a, a bit about how the internet might have played a role in empowering connections between communities to build such an international intercommunalism in ways that could not have been done in Huey's time. 
And so, uh, I, you know, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, you can take that question any way direction you want to, but imagining uh, the role of the internet today, um, but also also remembering that you know he was doing this sans the internet um, back in 1971. Well, Huey warned us that this would happen too. And that same talk that I love so much at Boston College in 1970, he said, look at what's happening. Technology is becoming faster and quicker and soon it will take over our kind of our understanding of, of the world. And it, and it has happened. And that he, did, he didn't describe it as a negative thing, nor am I. He was just stating a fact that that technology exists. And now we know it also needs to have some of us in the seats of power because it can be used against us. So the more people of color, I wanna say, and I'm using that broadly, really broadly, and women and LGBTQ, and on and on people into which category I fit um, and young people be part of this. And as you know, that world is held by male and European American men. So we can insert ourselves as Gwendolyn. No, it wasn't Gwendolyn Brooks. There was someone else who said, if, if you don't have a seat at the table, then bring a folding chair. And so it's important that we understand that Huey was visionary. He could see the future in a certain way. And this isn't mysticism. It was just the way his mind worked. And I would encourage people to read the Boston College speech. It's dense and it's beautiful. Absolutely. Um, Could I really quickly comment on yeah, it? So, I, you know, I just want to say really quickly that um, obviously there's international solidarity pre-internet and pre-Twitter and the rest of it. So even though it is a tool of our times, I do think it has allowed people to break through mainstream corporate propaganda at a faster rate maybe than it was doing the Vietnam War, right? So I do think it has benefits in that way, but by no means do we need the internet to gain international solidarity or to break away. But I do think in this day and time, the way it has been used by, let's say, people on the left to break through corporate uh, positioning of, of, of international struggles, obviously or even local struggles or repression tactics, I think has been fantastic. This is in my, you know, 30 somewhat years of organizing uh, and being in solidarity with Palestine. This is the largest outpouring of support I've ever seen. And I do think that some of that has been hastened because of people's access and ability to turn the tails on what corporate media is spinning, on what the Israeli government is spinning, on what the State Department is spinning. And so for those purposes, I see that I see it as a good thing. But as folks would obviously acknowledge, uh, the internet or social media is obviously a mixed bag because we don't control it. Um, and therefore, we are flooded with other pieces of information, which is mind numbing. Um, and so for those folks to break through, uh, to break through and use it, I think is pretty incredible. Um, and I just want to give a plug to also the Black Power Media uh, that, you know, the you appear on. Um, and also make the comparison that the fact that, you know, when, I mean, if I may, that uh, during Huey's time of his writing, that, you know, the, the Black Panther Party newspaper had hundreds of thousands of subscribers and was a, was was considered one of the, the most well-read newspapers in the country. Um, and so the, so the ideas were actually getting out there in mass circulation. Um, and, you know, and you think about, like, you know, the use of, like, you know, the modernization of hashtags you know, the use of the Panther symbol and the work of Emory Douglas, it goes on and on, you know, in terms of the influence that it has today in terms of that. 
Um, I do want to move move on with a specific question for Kamal. It's from GQ Diamond Stone. It says, "Is the, it will be useful to gather and share lessons learned around navigating constraints in the state, especially where, where those constraints continue to limit capacity to build out limited liberated spaces." I'm also curious about how Kamal's under, how, how Kamal understands nationalism as one compass of his work. Um, if if uh, I may have misunderstood his intro. Does, does that make sense to you, Kamal, the question? I think so. I'll, I'll try to muddle through it. And if I get it wrong, then ask again, or we can move on really quickly. Okay. So um, when I say I'm a nationalist, I mean that Black people have a right to self-determination, in particular my nationalism, that Black people have a right to self-determination. But I don't consider myself a narrow. I see narrow nationalism as a tool as well as an ideology. I'm not a narrow nationalist. I consider myself to be under the practice of revolutionary nationalism. So I believe that any nationalism that moves us or keeps us in a space of capitalist control or, or, or corporate control or dictatorship is obviously a narrow nationalism that needs to be defeated. Uh, but I do think that Black people, particularly because of our circumstances here in the Western Hemisphere um, and other people based on their circumstances around the world, have used revolutionary nationalism as a tool, as a forward tool of fighting back against the state and fighting to gain liberation. And so therefore I would never take it out the toolbox as something that unites people, organizes people, brings certain groups together, as long as we don't start to have it turn on ourselves and start to believe that because we practice one thing or we believe that we have a right to self-determination, that that somehow makes us better than somebody else. So that somehow puts us on top of somebody else or that our own experiences means that we can now go oppress somebody else. That is not the nationalism that I believe in. Um, may I mention something, Kaz? I didn't mention it earlier. I just wanted to tell people that Huey Newton's widow, Frederica Newton, um, worked for years to develop something that is now in place, and that is the Huey P. Newton Foundation. And its base is in Oakland, California, where the Black Panther Party's base was. And last month, uh, a dream of Huey's, and also it was the dream of many of us, um, a Black Panther Party museum has opened. Mm. And it is um, dedicated to the history in downtown Oakland at 1427 Broadway in Oakland. I don't know how many listeners, participants are uh, live in California. So I'm just saying that, but it's open from, I think Tuesday to Friday from 10 to three, I could be boogering up the times, but Wednesday to Saturday from 10 to 3 p.m. by appointment. It is beautiful and it is, it really honors the community survival programs. There is a an exhibit up of, about the Oakland Community School that few people know about because people think the party ended in 1974 and it lasted until 1982. And that school lasted until then. So I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier. No, please, absolutely. And I believe uh, someone had put a link to the uh, the school in the in the chat. Uh, it was is the the link was is the Q P Newton. I'm sorry, could you read it for me, uh, Yvonne? I can't see the, the chat the right now. Q P Newton Foundation. Yep. And the Black Panther Party Museum, and the exhibit that I'm talking about. There are a number of exhibits there. The one I'm talking about is called Each One Teach One, right. which is something we borrowed from Malcolm X. Um, and, and if I can just say, one thing that I think is really amazing about the, his, the history of the Black Panther Party is that people don't not only know the names of the individuals, but they know the names of the chapters, yes. you know, and that speaks to the, the depth of people's love, you know, for the Panther Party, like, you know, in New York City and Oakland and throughout the world, you talk about the, the Oakland chapter, the Omaha chapter, the New York chapter, and these spaces that keep this memory alive are so crucial. And I think that's really dope that this exists. So um, so definitely check it out. Um, I want to answer, maybe we want to a couple, a couple um, 
have a couple of questions that we can couple together and just do as a, as a kind of a final round. Um, and then um, and probably get some closing thoughts. Because um, I think right now we're at uh, uh, 526 and the interpreters have a hard stop at 530. Um, John Verdar, thank you, thank you to everyone. I'm learning and thinking about so much here. I'm curious if we've seen and learned from some of the capture all offices strategy from the far right in the US. I feel like white supremacist capitalist evangelicism has been successfully in building captured areas, even as beyond people's, even beyond people who are politically engaged. Curious if it's always about building differently or also is it about winning the dog catch election and up, et cetera. I wanna I'm gonna actually give that to James because you talked earlier about the local. And I was wondering if you want to take that on real quick. Uh, there's a lot uh, in that uh, in that that amazing question. That's almost like an entirely uh, entire panel just on uh, on on its own. Um, I'm, what that makes me think about is how the far right is so good at taking legitimate grievances and directing people towards illegitimate uh, so, uh, so, solutions, right, and filling. Uh, you know, filling people's needs for connection with one another uh, through one of the one of the worst versions of Christianity uh, that, 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 that we've ever seen. And we know that there's some very beautiful uh, traditions of that. So to me, that just reinforces the need for us to uh, to or to do the deep type of organizing that Kamau references that the Black Panther Party and the and the and the First Rainbow Coalitions attempted to do before they were destroyed uh, through state and offer our alter, alternatives uh, there because uh, the the right is def is definitely winning its war of position right right now but that's not the way it has to be forever. Sorry, Kazembe, I, I apologize. Um, can I suggest, because we have two more minutes, can we like maybe officially close and then this will allow the uh, interpreters to take leave? And then um, I don't know what, uh, what schedule the panelists have, but if folks want to continue to stay and talk, they're welcome to, because there are more questions here, but that we just at least close and provide the space for folks, you know, if they need to leave, to leave. Uh, okay, sorry. So um, I, I'm sorry. So I'll just really quickly uh, close us officially for now. And thank you, interpreters. Um, so thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I think it's been asked a number of times, but the recording will be made available on the website municipalism.org um, pretty soon after this uh, this panel is over. Um, so you please, it, you know, we, we try to do this as an offering for um, for people. So please let us know how this was for you and how we can, you know, better, you know, provide these sort of political education offerings in the future. So we do have a survey at municipalism.org forward slash survey. Uh, our next panel is going to be on May Day. So we are going to be releasing the Municipalist Organizers Toolkit. So come and join us for that. Um, and you can subscribe to our mailing list on our website. And we are a very grassroots uh, initiative. <laughs> so if you have the resources, we really do appreciate uh, your support. So thank you so much. It is um, it is at the time. So thank you to the interpreters. Thank you, Kazembe. Thank you to the panelists. But uh, I, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So if if, if you need to leave us, uh, you know, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, and then Kazembe, I'm going to hand this back over to you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And I appreciate it. And I know Gene. Oh, yeah, so, um, okay, cool. So we, we got, so we have a chance to talk a little bit longer. Um, and actually, I wanted to actually um, bring up one other question. And, and think, I mean, first of all, does anyone else want to have uh, maybe respond to the question on the far right in the state? 
Okay. I, I, I simply want to say that there's always a far right. There's always the state at odds with the people. It's not, it, it will be that way until some time, kind of collective understanding emerges around the world. But for now, I, I don't think it's a good idea to focus our energies, our cognitive or heart space on what they are doing. We must know what they're doing. But this is something I learned about the community survival programs, or even when I was incarcerated, that I had to keep serving the people. And so I just felt to say that. Um, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to, uh, maybe couple this question because we talked earlier around, uh, issues around, uh, this question, uh, for everybody, but particularly for Kamau and Erica, um, you know, we talk a lot about one of the least talked about aspects of the EP Newton's notion of intercommunalism is a question of care, um, you know, and, and concern, you know, amongst people. And I know, in the cases of um, um, Kamal, you've been very much involved in the Stop Cop City movement, which has been seen some, a lot of oppression um, in terms of uh, people going to jail. And I know personally yourself, Erica, you've mentioned this earlier. How do you how how do you um, navigate issues around care and concern in the movement in the face of oppression? And this is a paraphrase of a question um, that a uh, sister had. Uh, uh, I had actually asked uh, in the in the chat. I'll start so Erica could finish. Um, I think it's an extremely important question and one that the movement has not always done a great job at, to be honest. Um, I think the the ability mm -hmm. of the movement to not only support our political prisoners, our prisoners of war, the young people now who are, like you said, being jailed because of their organizing and activism or on VICO charges, uh, on uh, domestic terrorism charges. Uh, I, you know, here in Atlanta, folks have tried their best, of course, to have wraparound support for folks who are um, arrested and jailed, including the, the bail fund, including support for people once they're out. Um, but we continually, even as a movement, I think not only on the idea of caring for people who've been imprisoned, but finding out and figuring out even some simple things about caring for each other within movement spaces so that we don't have as many splits. So we don't have as much people leaving movement spaces and being frustrated with movement spaces. It's not easy. It's extremely difficult. I don't think we, even in this time period uh, that we figured it out. And I think some of that friction, of course, is purposely ca caused. But I also think amongst ourselves, including myself, like we've all been practitioners of not understanding how to give care to each other or how to not let arguments develop into uh, segmentation of movements, right? And then lastly, so I feel like you gave me a great opening. Um, so we at Community Movement Builders, in speaking of care, we have a Black Panther mutual aid fund uh, that I dropped in the chat um, and so what we started here, like about a year and a half ago, was after I think Jaleel Matakin gave a speech um, or talked about uh, the Fred Hampton movie and how people know more about the Panthers today than ever, but do less to support. So we devised a system of supporting members of the Black Panther Party. Every month we give $500 to $600 to approximately five to six Black Panther Party members. I dropped the link, I guess, at least in the webinar chat. If somebody could drop it in the larger chat, I'd be much grateful. People give us five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars a month. And all of those resources get go back to various men, members of the Panther Party who need it. We ask no questions. All we do is make sure that folks who need it get it and they can use it on whatever they want to use it on, right? Um, so for us, that's part of our care network, part of how we help support. Uh, the veterans who have come before us, who are still around, like we say, there's no healthcare system or retirement plan for revolutionaries. We do what we can to fill in where, like, as we can. And so, 
people look out for the um, the mutual aid support for members of the Black Panther Party. And we've extended it a little bit to people in the liberation struggle who are veterans, but I uh, just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. Um, Kamal, can you thank everybody that has anything to do with making the mutual aid support happen? I know about it. And um, there is one woman, um, Donald Cox's daughter, who is very instrumental in making sure that that care is going to people who need it. Um, it's just very touching. Can you th thank people for all of us? Yes, yes. And I think that um, what that brings to mind is how we, we think that these relatively fragile human bodies can continue to survive without care. First, first, Huey had to explain to people why we had community survival programs. Why can't you just go to revolution? Well, that obviously is made, that statement is made by people who have never gone hungry and watched their babies starve, who have been refused medical care, who are frightened as elders to travel alone to the bank or the grocery store. So I think it is important to understand that revolution doesn't occur because we say it will. It involves various multi-layered steps along the way. And, um, and, and care is not a frivolous, frivolous and um, selfish thing. If a car doesn't have, for instance, its oil changed, well, you're in real trouble one day. Well, we don't think of the human body like that. And I actually want to say this, and it has nothing to do with the wonderful company I'm right now in, it's primarily male, that these paradigms about revolution and who is a revolutionary, who is an activist, who is a true Marxist, who isn't, all these things were cr created from the male perspective. They were not created by women. However, the party's community survival programs were not only coordinated by women, but sustained. And we know why, because the vision or the idea is one thing, carrying it out is another. And we just, we, we work 19 hour days then. And I think it would be the same now um, from what you are saying, Kamau, about, I love the idea of the deep dive. I never called it that, but one of the women in, women in the book um, titled Comrade Sisters, Women of the Black Panther Party, um, the women, 50 women share their stories of being in the party. If you have not seen or read this book, you must. It is so beautiful. And um, so they talk about, this is, this is how one woman described it. We serve the people. And in order to serve the people, you have to love the people. And what does she mean? That meant that we had a free clothing and shoe program, a coat and boot program in New York and in Boston and so on. Why? Winter. We cared about people individually and collectively. If they were, if, if they were in front of us, we, we listened and we took heed. And this idea of self-care being frivolous is dangerous. It's very dangerous because some of us did not, we physically survived our respective movements, but our minds and hearts did not. Just, I just want to say, um, I have to jump off here uh, because I have to go see my friend. And if I don't see my friend, I'll, do, I'll literally be in self-care tonight on Valentine's Day. It was just a joke. Um, Anyway, I just want to, um, I'm going to turn it over to Yvonne 
I just want to say thank you to everybody, Erica, James, and that come out for your time and effort tonight. Um, and to be continued. And um, I appreciate you to be in space with all your comrades. All right, have a good night now. Thank you. Thank you, Kazembe. Um, so I I I uh, I just put a link. Kazembe is uh, curating a film series at the Maisel's Documentary Center in Harlem. So uh, I definitely uh, recommend if if you are uh, in New York City to check it out. And I think he has a film tonight. So <laughs> he's had pretty a pretty packed day. Um, I know that there's like 11 questions that are still open. I know that James, you said you have to head out shortly. Um, so, you know, I, uh, I, I'm actually, there's 53, okay, there's, there's about 50 people still here. Um, cause, uh, Kamau and Erica, um, I'm not sure what your time is like, if there are questions that you would like to address, um, or maybe, maybe, maybe James, if, Maybe we'll just do one last round. How about that, if that's okay? And then James, do you want to go first? Because it seems like you you have to go, and then um, and then Erica and oh, do you have to go to come out? I have to go now. Yeah, so oh, I'm going to okay. say my goodbyes and okay. thanks. Thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, I really do appreciate it. We put the chat in here, and thanks everybody who's donated, given, and Kimberly Marshall in particular has been fantastic when she came across the fund. And she started talking about her direct connections. It made it so much easier to do the funds. My connections were limited in New York base. Hers are all across the country. And it's made it so much easier to get resources out to people at a faster rate. So thank everybody. And thank you so much for having me. I appreciate you guys. Take care. So um, Yvonne, what is the question? Oh, oh so there's, there's like 12 open questions here. Um, I would say if if there's a particular question that speaks to you that you would like to address. Well, you um, want to say that, okay. So, so there, there are a lot of questions here. Uh, James, do you have a time constraint as well? I can go a little longer. I'm, I'm almost prepared for this class that I'm teaching, so. Okay. Um, so like, for instance, Erica, um, there's a question that Nyla C had for you. Um, if this is not too personal, can I ask how you made it through solitary confinement? Mentally, how did you continue to remain healthy? Thank you for everything you have done for us. Sending you all love. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's just for, for instance, uh, a specific question that, um, was um, asked for you specifically. Yeah, there's another one right under it. Um, well, maybe we should find one that, since you can stay on, um, James, why don't you find one that you wanna answer? Actually, I would like to bounce off of those beautiful, your last comments that actually also connects with some of these is that when we talk about care and love, they are absolutely everything that you said in the movement, but it's also security. Because if you look at the roots of COINTELPRO, and I mean, going back to when J. Edgar Hoover was, he was a young, young man in 1917 during the Palmer Raids and how disruption and uh, infiltration has evolved over the past decades, we think of the really big moments like the Fred Hampton uh, murder, the expulsion of of of, of immigrants in the in, in the twenties, but what we sometimes fail to realize is that COINTELPRO like tactics have always taken advantage of uh, of unkindness within the movement and spaces where there is no love in between revolutionaries and and, and activists because they. Those are the little splits that can ha that that become big when you get the state state there. So things like being responsible for how one talks to another person in the movement, how one manages rumors and innuendo, um, how one shows kindness when somebody is distressed. Because when someone is distressed and in crisis, is the number one time when they can be recruited by the state. So I just really wanted to. Uh, Add that because um, your your comments were so particularly um, moving, and they also have such such a high um, 
high value for just thinking about how do we keep keep ourselves safe in these really perilous times that we're in again. Um, Yvonne, why don't you pick a question? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. All right. Um, okay, so um, it seems it seems like at least two people wanted to um, have have you address have both of you address this question from Matthew Epperson. Epperson. Um, so uh, just sort of recapping that the the economics for emancipation has you know three different responses to racialized capitalism. You can smash it. You know you could tame it. You could in other words, like sort of reform it, um, and, or you could escape it. You could, you know, like build a liberated zone um, or, you know, sort of uh, create sort of a maroonage society. Um, and so does that framing capture a sufficient response to racial capitalism in, you know, both of your views? I, I don't believe, actually, Yvonne, that I understand the essential question. Okay, okay. I guess, so if I could elaborate, Matthew, uh, uh, on Matthew's question, my understanding is, um, okay, so my understanding is that a, a lot of this is also coming from this, uh, this Marxist sociologist, Eric Olin Wright, but basically, there are th three different strategies to basically change, like change the world, right? You could fight, you could fight it, you could, you know, have a war of position and, you know, bring out your guns and and fight the fight the state, fight capital, you know, seize the means of production. You could try to reform it, maybe either through non-reformist reforms or, you know, electing anyone but Trump, for instance, or you could run away. You know, you could, um, you know, try to find a place that's relatively safe from climate catastrophe and build, you know, earth seed, you know, like Octavia Butler wrote. And so uh, if my sense and apologies, Matthew, if Epperson, if I am totally not understanding what your question is, my sense is that Matthew is asking, is that is that is that are those the only strategies? Is there anything else we could be doing? There are all kinds of other things, but it would take me um, longer than a couple of minutes to talk about it. I think that sometimes when we write about the way we can do things, we limit the actual lives we're living. Like the Black Panther Party did all, all three of those. So there have to be more than three because that was such a long time ago, um, over 55 years. So I'll stop there. James? In, you offer a lot to, to, for us to think about, Matthew. And yeah, there's always, there's always more. Those are three of the most popular ones throughout uh, history. But they also seem like tactics to me rather than strategies, right? They seem like, you know, we, people who want to change the world have to, have to have been called to do all three of those things depending on the conditions of the of, of the time um but also i think that we we were also in in a real in a in a point where we have to think about the type of social change that only conversations can happen so as long as my wonderful neighbor down the street who i adore who's always looking out for um for community safety and always someone sick is always the first person to offer support is also the, the same person who thinks that that i uh that la migra and the police are the solution to our community's problems there's conversations i could i have to have with her and people like that before we can even get to big projects right and this is this is a woman who of uh, you know who who is all heart right who wants to see her com her community be safe and is subscribing to some really right-wing ways of going about it so uh there's certain political conversations that i have to have before we even get get to uh get get to those those steps and not that they can maybe not that they can't happen simultaneously but um uh, we're um, we're we're living we're certainly living in an era, in an era where people are being fed so um, false solutions like 
like, like always, but as a, such a uh, such a rapid clip, right? So, um, can I suggest maybe we just, uh, if the two of you just do one last round, just any concluding thoughts? Uh, thank you for the forty people that are still here with us. <laughs> um, I will answer the the question from the. Um... There are two questions I'm going to answer at once, okay? Because they're directed to me. Um, and I don't know. I mean, th th these are my experiences, so I don't. I'll do my best to combine them. So no, to, to Nyla, it's not too personal. Um, I talk about it all the time because I find that when I talk about something that was hurtful, that eventually it helps the healing process. So what I did when I was incarcerated and in solitary confinement is I taught myself to meditate. Nobody was in my ear or in my head or any other part of me. It was my idea. And I asked one of my lawyers to get me a book. And I did. And I didn't know what I was doing. And I did it. And why did I do it? because my baby daughter and John Huggins' mother who'd lost her only son would visit me only for one hour every Saturday. And I couldn't be present without crying. And I asked myself, what am I gonna do? This is not right for them. I wanted something that would benefit them. And it actually turned out that that little book that Charlie Gary got me, um, which showed yoga postures and had a very simple thing about meditation, just sit still a while and breathe. I know that in every one of my days from then to now, because I do that, I am able to be more present. And the first time after doing that for about a week, that Saturday, I was more present. I was able to play with my baby daughter I was able to talk with Elizabeth Huggins. I would cry all the way back to the cell. But at least it wasn't dropping around onto them from me. It became a bigger thing. It became such that in my continued work, because I did not stay there in prison um, without bail, there was a mistrial de declared and Bobby Seale and I walked free. But all of the work I've done since then has been impacted about how I show up. Am I really listening to people? Am I paying attention to what is needed? Am I practicing not just compassion, but empathy? Meaning, do I step in the shoes of? The second question was about the US organization, and I want to correct a misunderstanding. The FBI, at the FBI counterintelligence program um, made it their business and took taxpayers' money to do it. Taxpayers, like my mother and father, um, they wanted to misinform, misdirect, um, and as they said in their own statement, further neutralize the impact of black liberation movements. Now, the Black Panther Party was not just black in any way. However, that was the FBI thinking. And so what actually happened is that informants, and you inferred this, James, who were in both organizations orchestrated that run by the FBI, we couldn't have prevented it. Security doesn't prevent that because people who became informants were often our, our friends. They didn't just place people in our offices, they placed people in our beds that we loved. Because what were they doing? They were grooming and manipulating black people who just didn't wanna go back to jail. That's part of what was going on for most of them. These were not career FBI operatives at all. 
how do I know that this is true? Because a former FBI operative, an informant, met with me a year after John and Bunchy were killed and told me that they set it up. They were killed on the UCLA campus in broad daylight. And I met with him at a very public place with one of my friends that didn't smile a lot. But he told me he couldn't sleep, he couldn't eat. He couldn't hold it any longer because it was wrong. And I believed him. Not because I'm Pollyanna, I'm a human being. This is what this is what state sanctioned violence does. It pits people against one another. It pits movements against one another. We didn't have any any kind of anything with the us organization until the week that John and Bunchy were killed. That whole week there was something different happening. And John knew he was going to die. And so did I. So I'm sharing this with you from the bottom of my heart. I believe in that blaming the past or blaming people in the past doesn't help me. That's my own personal thing, but I do know and met many informants who came to me and said, sis, I'm out of here. They told me you guys were thugs and hoodlums and trying to take everybody's good life away. That's not true. You're doing good. I'm gone. I'll never forget that conversation with one of these very people. I loved him like a brother. So I want to be clear in both these questions. The thing is, how do you handle being a culture keeper, an activist, a revolutionary, a change maker, whatever name you give to it, your heart full of love has to be open and love can be very stern as well. Yeah. I'm not talking about TV love. I'm talking about that the power of love. So I took a while to answer, but I think it was worth it because I, I like interrupting narratives that are not true and also looking at self-care as something that impacts the person who is caring for themselves or others. Thank you for the questions. I think that's a really beautiful place to end and I have nothing to add. Uh, except if anybody wants to get in touch and talk more, uh, this is my very public email. Uh, it's been, it's all over the place. So just go ahead and get um, get in touch. And thank you so much, Erica, for uh, for everything. Just uh, ab absolutely mind blowing and spirit nurturing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much to to both of you and to the the forty people or so that are still with us. Can I say um, one thing for the for the forty people that are still here that should have been said when one hundred and fifty six people were here? This wouldn't <laughs> have happened without you, Yvonne, and your hard your your yes. hard work. I know you have a team, but you also deserve some uh, some ma some massive props for uh, ma making this happen. Oh, thank you. And, and in the darkness that we are facing in our world, it's always wonderful to meet such a bright light, Yvonne. Oh, that's really lovely. Thank you so much. You're going to make me cry again, Erica. <laughs> I hope they're joyful tears. And I wish everybody um, not just a day of honoring love, but a life of honoring love and its, its power and its impact. So thank you. Thank you so much. And we will have a part two to this conversation. I... I I think we, 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 yes, we, maybe even three and four. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everybody.